With degrees in both art and computer science, Dr. Mori has 25 years experience in developing innovative techniques for rich, emotionally evocative virtual reality environments. As part of uh, this pioneering work, she invented a scent collar to bring the emotional power of smell to immersive experiences and developed new types of functions for VR, such as connections to multiple sensor and feedback systems to make VR more effective. Dr. Mori has spent 13 years as a senior research scientist at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, which she helped found. While there, she created novel VR telehealth care telehealth care activities using her deep understanding of art, computer animation, and human behavior to enhance patient engagement with these programs. In the mid-1990s, Dr. Mori started comprehensive computer animation training programs at Walt Disney Feature Animation, combining art and technology topics, which she later expanded to the special effects industries at studios such as Rhythm and Hughes. Prior to that, Mori did worked at UCF's Institute for Simulation and Training, where she developed techniques to make VR environments more immersive and emotionally compelling, and helped lead a group of innovative students called the Toy Scouts, which is funny. <laughs> she, um, she has been expanding her VR research to include neuroscience and avatars, developing methods to determine how such technologies can affect positive change in those who use them. I'm going to talk a little bit of, uh, in sort of a disjointed way about building with scent for VR. Um, uh, I had a friend say to me a few months ago that that would mean no more two cents VR, which I thought was a, a great little phrase. So I'm using that. I told him I'd steal it. The first wave of VR was kind of in the mid 60s. It was a, a small wave, but an important wave. And we are now in what I consider to be the third wave of VR. Uh, in 1989, I was trying to see how we could add emotions and meaning to virtual reality, which was, while new and fascinating, kind of boring. The environments were not something you really wanted to hang out in, but that's another talk. Um, I have a long time interest in the power of scent to add and enhance meaning in our lives. And right now I'm kind of focused on scent as it pertains to new immersive technologies. So multi-sensory VR, um, I, I truly believe that VR should utilize multiple senses, uh, which allows us to harness more areas of the brain, which can lead to richer and fuller experiences. And those can lead to better memory formation and better learning opportunities. So that, you know, what is true now, as it was way back when, when I started in VR, is VR is typically limited just to visuals and to sound. Two other senses, touch and smell, are not used much. So they're still fairly rare. There's something missing. Uh, in the early 2000s, though, I saw that you could buy these big, huge tower blower contraptions, like a big PC, into which you could place this big cartridge that was infused with a single smell. It was maybe uh, 12 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches. Um, and this device, this tower had dials on the back where you could control a timer and you could control the airflow intensity. But uh, you could program it to say, turn on in five minutes, be on for a minute at high, um, you know, a high airflow. And that was about it. That was the rudimentary controls that you could do. Now, I still wanted to use this, and we had in my research lab a VR theater where we were working on an AI demo with virtual humans, and this was a demo of a leader who had to deal with a sticky situation in a Bosnian village, and um, he had to think about what to say. So you would be talking to this other virtual human here as, a, um, as the trainee. Um, I designed this town and the atmosphere and the people in it and, uh, you know, for what rudimentary uh, software we had back then. Um, but I really wanted to put the smells in it. So I got those tower situations, those big tower things, and I got two smells from them. One was diesel exhaust and one was kind of the smell of a, of a town after a rainstorm, after a dusty you know, street got wet. Um, so we ran those a couple of times and my fellow researchers actually hated the idea. They hated this plussing up of their work. Um, and 
the reason that they hated it was because the bad smells they thought would make people think their research was bad. Um, couldn't convince them otherwise. Now, I want to acknowledge that, you know, I was certainly not the first person to want multi-sensory experiences as evidenced by companies who were selling these big room sized devices. But as far back as the 1940s, we started to see experimentation in the film community. Uh, Walt Disney was one of the first filmmakers to explore the idea of including sense with his 1940 film Fantasia, which he decided not to do after all for cost reasons. A very few movies were also presented with smells over the following decades, mostly as an afterthought, although the film The Scent of Mystery was actually written with smells in mind. Uh, Saskia has a chapter in a recently edited book that I uh, just did, and you could paste that, um, that first link into the chat. And her chapter goes into a lot more history on um, the of scent in film, among other things. It's a really fascinating chapter. So the granddaddy of all the proto VR experiences using smells and 4D effects like we today see in some movies and location-based entertainment was Mort Heilig. This was in the 1950s. He invented something called Sensorama, which you see here, which was actually an early form of VR. The most fascinating thing about Mort Heilig was that in order to realize this vision, he had to invent every single bit of the technology to make it happen, including a huge stereo camera rig that could be um, walked around with on a single person. He had motion platforms in this thing to make it feel like you were riding a motorcycle, fans for winds to hit your face and something to release smells. So one of the experiences he had was riding a motorcycle through the streets of New York, going past pizza parlors and things like that. Um, so you would smell that pizza. He also had this way of effectively shutting out the rest of the physical world, which is what we see in VR today. Now, even Mort realized that he wasn't the only one to come up with the concept of making a reality alongside the one that we, we enjoy physically. Here's what he said. When anything new comes along, everyone, like a child discovering the world, thinks that they've invented it. But you scratch a little and you find a caveman scratching on a wall is creating virtual reality in a sense. What's new here is that more sophisticated instruments give you the power to do it more easily. And that's where we are today. I think especially with scent and some of the multi-sensory possibilities for virtual reality, we are at a place where we can, we have more tools, we can do it more easily. So obviously those big cartridge systems I was using were not the best solution. So I started looking for something better, something that wouldn't piss off my fellow researchers. Um, it had to be something that was lightweight. Um, it had to not be bulky and noisy like the original machine. Um, it couldn't fill up the room with smells, which was something that also bothered the researchers because that room would smell like diesel exhaust for hours and hours after um, we would run the experiment. Um, it had to be easy to change out the individual scent sources. It had to have simple controllers. And so I invented this thing called a scent collar that would um, give us those capabilities. And here's the original diagram for it. It's not what it ended up looking like, as you'll see. Uh, but we still had a big lack of sources for good scent materials back then. So this was 2004. Here's what the original scent collar looked like. Um, we had to figure out materials that didn't hold the scent. Um, here we see some brushed aluminum cartridges and we ended up having to anodize those because uh, otherwise they held the smell and we could never clean them. There was a little, uh, a little reservoir underneath where you could put a, a cotton wick that had a scent uh, oil or a scent material on it and you'd put it back in and there were fans in the rest of the cartridge that would direct the smells towards your nose. And these were easily um, swapped out and they didn't spray at you. 
that it's a fan just sort of took the molecules that were coming off of the wick and kind of aimed them at your face. So it was very safe for the wearer. We controlled it with Bluetooth signals, so it was wireless. Um, and we ended up getting a patent on this uh, after much experimentation. Uh, here's the patent. And we used it for a number of the experiments that we did at this research lab. I mean, this was a research lab, so mostly what we were doing was inventing things and testing things with studies. So we are now on the fourth uh, generation of the scent collar, and I'll show that in a bit. But first, I, I really want to talk about the design process. So here's a wonderful quote from Laurie Anderson. VR will never look real until they learn how to put some dirt in it. And I love this quote. Um, but what does she mean by dirt? How do you add dirt to VR? Dirt can be a number of things. It can be a child who is dirty from playing hard to the steamy aroma of um, coming up from freshly turned earth or compost. In my mind, it shouldn't just be something we smell, but a part of a gestalt reaction to the concept of dirt, to everything that says dirt. Um, there's a wonderful article um, about dirt that you can post, uh, you can put that link into the, into the chat window. Um, what does dirt mean to you? I mean, really, it depends on our experiences and um, you know, what, we, what we believe dirt is, good or bad. So I do think it should create a, a, a very visceral reaction uh, in the person that experiences the dirt that you're trying to share. And I would alter Laurie Anderson's quote just a little bit to say, VR will never feel real until they learn to put smells in it because dirt is not simply a texture map, which is all we have in VR right now for dirt. Um, both adding smells as well as designing for these kind of gestalt reactions is, is an evolving art form, uh, just as creating the visuals and the sound for our current um, kind of VR we have today has been done over the last couple of decades. We're just starting in this idea of how do we get the multi-sensory and that fuller experience into VR. Um, people want things to be easy. They want it to be plug and play, but smells in the real world are not like that. And our reactions to the fullness of the world are not simple either. So really want to expand VR to be richer than just what, um, what it seems to be looking like and sounding like. So we have those sights and sounds down for VR design, but how do we do this richer combinatoric multi-sensory design? For sense, we can start asking ourselves some questions. How are sense important to your experience? How do you want people to react? Um, we need to be also be aware that people have a wide range of responses to different smells. Uh, some people's scent is somebody else's stink. Um, for example, most people like the smell of cinnamon, and I absolutely hate it, <laughs> which I have to explain over and over again when they put cinnamon on my coffee at Starbucks. Um, so this is a little kind of design exercise. If you if you wanted to have your immediate world reduced to a few salient scents, what would they be? Or a VR environment you wanted to build? Um, what would those scents be? What would be the ones that defined that environment? Why are those scents there? And what is the meaning that they have for you? So, um, you know, if anybody wants to pop something in the chat, uh, that they want to share or just think about this for later. Um, you know, like if I was building a garden VR environment, I would want that smell of the freshly turned earth. I would want, um, I would want, I would want the smell of compost in there. I would want to have those smells make me feel close to the earth and close to the garden. So, I'm not seeing the chat, so I don't know if anybody has put anything in, but... Um, well, uh, James, uh, who spoke 
couple days ago says geosmin, uh, which is that earthy smell. I say tomato leaf. Some tomato. people say tomato leaf, yeah. So yeah. his stuff says the plastic hose, of course. Ah, when it's new. <laughs> when it's new, yeah. Ariana agrees with me that tomato, freshly cut grass. Yeah, tomato is my husband's favorite scent, believe it or not. He, it's one of the few things he'll go out to the garden to smell. So, um, yeah, so, you know, these things that evoke in us either memories or feelings or um, emotional reactions, I think these are the things that scent can give us in a VR environment, just like they give them to us in our physical environment. So now I, I want to share some thoughts from a VR work I did from 2005 to 2007. It was called The Memory Stairs. Um, this was a series of environments meant to emplace participants in experiences from before birth to near death. Um, the first experience was before birth with the perspective of, of a participant being in the womb. And for that one, I didn't really want any smells, but I focused on very fuzzy visuals and sounds heard through liquid and two heartbeats. But for the next one, Just New, which you see an image on, uh, from on the left, the participant is a baby in a crib. And I did want smells. The first smell, kind of cliche, was baby powder. Um, now, most of a baby's memories are pre-linguistic, with, and without words, it's difficult to access those memories. In this um, experience, I wanted to see if sight, sounds, and smells might unlock some of those pre-linguistic memories. Uh, I did a lot of research on um, what babies uh, are aware of an experience from, uh, from birth on till about two years old, and I used a lot of that research in building this. Um, one of the things that babies do respond to, as we all know, is faces and movement. So I had a mobile um, that was above the crib that, that turned and had music. But I have these giant faces that came in and out and Googled and cooed at you. Um, and the baby would close its eyes and then open. And um, you didn't have a lot of movement, but all this stuff was happening around you and the smells were there. And when the mother's face would come in, to the, to the baby, um, the baby would smell her perfume. And that perfume was actually my mother's perfume, which was Estelada's Youth Dew, which many of you have probably smelled. And um, if you ever look at what base notes lists Youth Dew's notes to be, um, I think it would take me too long to read it here because there's a ton of them, but it's a very, very unique smell. Um, in a later experience, the, the forgotten rooms of the memory stairs, which you see on the right, there was the smell of the fireplace and pipe tobacco that permeated the space. I wanted the space to feel older than anything you knew, with whiffs of fires long extinguished in the fireplace and redolent pipe tobacco lingering in the air, age vapors permeating every single object. As a gestalt design approach, the visuals also had to support this feeling, as well as the sounds, a gestalt of age and loss and flashbacks to a place never known, but somehow very familiar. Um, in this forgotten room, the lugubrious sound of a clock, you see it on the mantle there, ticks, but so slowly, it seems like it's counting ages, not seconds and it makes everything slow down. So the, the smells and the visuals and the sounds all work in concert to give you this really unique experience. So then VR disappeared. So <laughs> I finished that project and I, I ended up getting a PhD uh, as with that as part of the work. Virtual reality was still happening, especially in the research labs I worked in, but it wasn't commercially uh, accepted. Uh, the stuff happening in the research labs showed that it was very effective for different kinds of applications like training and simulation, health-related applications, therapy. Um, these kinds of things was what was happening when nobody was paying attention to VR. And that was through most of the 2000s. Um, but there were still people interested in it. And so around 2006, I got approached by 
uh, an author from Popular Science who was doing research into scent use in general. Um, and he was doing, uh, really visiting a lot of the big fragrance places and uh, looking at how scent was being used all across the board. And he came out to the research lab and we talked and he wrote this really wonderful article about how we were using it there, um, as well as uh, explaining how my scent collar worked. Uh, this is another link you can put in the chat. Um, and he even took me down to Disney World for two days of scent exploration to see how Disney was using it everywhere there. So this was a really wonderful article at the time um, and really showed what scent could possibly do. Um, but it was, the, it was the winter of VR, so nothing much happened. And then VR came roaring back. So around 2012, a young man who worked at our lab called Palmer Lucky, he kick-started the Oculus Quest or the Oculus head-mounted display. It was called the DK1 for a developer's kit one. It wasn't commercial. These gamers who funded his Kickstarter to the tune of two and a half million dollars wanted to be inside their 3D game worlds. They didn't need scent, but this really uh, pushed the development of the gear that would make VR more commercially viable. Uh, the commercial version of, of Palmer's HMD was released in 2016 as the Oculus Rift. And this said to me, wow, there's a reason to bring back the scent collar. So in that year, uh, we started redesigning it uh, with, with better, um, uh, better components, uh, more flexible. It wasn't this hard thing you had to put up on your, your shoulders. It became a, a Velcroed uh, necklace that you could put around your, um, your neck and easily swap out these cartridges. Uh, this was done in conjunction with Brett Henning at Toy Shop Systems. And we took this to the Institute for Art and Olfaction in 2016 and uh, showed it there for the first time working. Um, now, learned my lesson about the bad smells. So this environment, uh, which was done by one of my students at uh, Otis College of Art and Design, but not for VR, was the kitchen of the French pastry chef who invented the macaroon cookie. So in this little um, environment, you could pick up the cookies and each cookie had a different scent and you could hold it near your face uh, with those controllers and smell coconut or chocolate or raspberry. And I can't remember the last smell we had, um, but there it was, we were able to do it. And here we are in 2020, we're currently redesigning this um, scent color for even better uh, usage. The cartridges will be smaller, easier to swap out. It'll be lighter, it'll be wearable or embedded. So you could embed it in um, a chair or whatever. Um, we're currently at the phase where we're looking for a Unity developer to write the API and we're seeking investors to help us bring it to market. Uh, but it's very exciting because everywhere I go, people want to put scent in their VR now and um, they need an easy way to do it. So, uh, and they need a safe way to do it. So I think uh, we have one of the solutions that people might be able to use. The final question is, are we there yet? And um, yeah, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there, the momentum's building. And I look back to when I first started uh, to put smells in VR and had to design and mix those smells by myself. And wow, I didn't know what I was doing. And now thankfully we have this wonderful community, thanks to Saskia and all of you out there who are making scent important in today's worlds, both physical and virtual, as it should rightfully be. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jackie. Um... Okay, lots of comments and questions. Uh, Julia wonders why, uh, about your opinion on why smell of vision and other scented viewing experiences have yet to really take off. I think we don't know enough about how scent affects us and we think we can just like throw cinnamon out there and everybody's gonna be happy. Um, and I think it's a much deeper thing that we have to explore the psychological basis as you know we're looking at the at the sort of chemical basis and and we know a little bit how it how it reaches our brain but we really don't know how it reaches the meaning in our brain and 
that is going to require more experimentation and knowing how much of a scent to put, maybe even taking a, 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 a a temperature, if you will, of the person who's going to go into something that's scented so you know whether there's a match there or there's going to be some dissonance. We just don't have that psychological profile, both of the sense and of the people that would be experiencing them. And I think, you know, when the film stuff came out, people thought, well, you know, first of all, you couldn't control what you were smelling. And it was just like a hammer hitting you on the head. So it's much more subtle than that. We may never get to something that's totally uh, programmable, but those are the things we have to think about. That's what I would like to push. Yeah, and I would add there's, I mean, I, and I know Christophe Le Damiel is in this crowd and I know that Tammy is in this crowd and people who have experience doing this, including myself, like I, I do think that also there's a cost quotient, you know, where it's just not scalable yet, you know, like where you can pop it in whatever cinema whenever and it's easy, you know, it's, uh, I think it represents a significant uh, investment for cinema owners at least, you know, as far as traditional film goes. Well, you know, and I'd liken it to when we, we had VR. We had VR as something that we were making. But that winter of VR, when it went back in the labs and we figured out, wow, it actually affects your brain like this, or it actually does this, and um, it can really change your, you know, it, it can work on your brain plasticity. It can do all of these things that we didn't know when VR was first thrown out there. We might have had ideas, but this is the phase of, of, of this kind of research that I think we need for the inclusion of scent and other multisensory aspects. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a few questions. We're not gonna be able to get to them all, unfortunately, um, but we will try to invite uh, Jackie to do a, a meet a nose or something so we can spend more time on it. But uh, Kurt, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir uh, asks, are there any thoughts of scent color as fashion accessory uh, beyond just for VR? Absolutely. In fact, yeah. it's, been in, it's been in a fashion show. It was in the 2004 SIGGRAPH Cyber Fashion Show. Um, so we have, we have definitely thought about it with that. And uh, right now for this new version, we have um, a, an industrial slash fashion designer looking at it. And um, Annette Wittrip has also said she would like to, to kind of take a pass at that. So uh, cool. as a fashion accessory, I think it could be customizable for so many cool things. I'm so excited about that aspect. Cool, make it holographic, please. <laughs> uh, just for me. Uh, Jazz is asking, and Fred, I'm, I'm skipping your question because, um, well, actually, let's, let's, let's ask it. Uh, how many cents can you display and how many at the same time, Frederick is asking? So with this um, with this version, uh, we've we've rejiggered the controller and um, and the board uh, so that we can do ten easily off of a single controller. Um, so you could just add them as you as you wanted. So we could do zero through nine, or we uh, probably will start with zero through six. But it can control ten. Uh, and then I think the question will end on. And sorry, Chach, but I know you're in touch anyway, so you can ask her personally. <laughs> Um, Jazz is asking, some of the biggest challenges for smell interfaces tend to be the refilling of cartridges and the lack of an RGB for smell. Uh, yes, we, uh, do you think there's any way to alleviate this issue or will this be a challenge that will limit the device to specialized uses? The refillability is pretty simple and I think what you want to do is, is you want to provide an atmosphere package of what you want and so maybe those six to ten cents would um, would be a package that you do and you have the refills on the on the shelf and really the way that we've got them it takes 10 seconds to, to refill. Um, and yet, so it's a, a, a filter paper that is um, uh, soaked in the scent material. And then you just keep little jars of those little filters and you just pop it in when, when um, it starts to fade. One of the big challenges is how long does the scent last in there? So I've had in the scent collar, some of the stuff we've done, you can still smell in the cartridges um, years after if we haven't taken them the wick out and uh, <laughs> and cleaned it. So um, one of the interesting things about this color is it takes very minimal amounts of smell and they last for quite a long time. So the, the cost on refilling and the ease of refilling is one of the benefits of it. 
Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Jackie, for your time as always.